Okay, thanks. Um, so the stuff I'm going to talk about is really um, a, a team effort. So I'd like to start by acknowledging the other people involved. Um, so we have a, a new DOE project on hydrogen storage with Joe Hupp, Mercury Canicetus, and Son Bin Nguyen, all from the chemistry department. And we've also done some work in the past with Linda Broadbelt and Don Ellis. Um, let me start by just giving you a very quick overview of what my group is interested in. So um, beyond hydrogen storage, um, we're also interested in other problems related to energy or the environment. So things like CO2 capture, um, energy efficient separations in general, um, ox um, automotive exhaust treatment, oxidation catalysis. And we're generally interested in developing new materials as a way to solve these types of problems. And my group is generally a, a modeling group. So we're trying to model these materials and come up with solutions for these types of problems. Um, so you're probably all familiar with the general issues with hydrogen, but let me give you a, a brief introduction. Um, so we heard a little bit already today about fuel cells. They're highly efficient. Uh, they're not limited by the Carnot efficiency. And a favorite fuel for, for um, fuel cells is hydrogen. You can also imagine using hydrogen in other ways. For example, um, you could take wind power, which is intermittent, and use that energy to produce hydrogen, which you could then use in a fuel cell at a time that you could control better. So if we want to do these things, um, there are a number of challenges. So you have to produce the hydrogen, you need to distribute it, and then you need a way of storing it. And I'm going to focus on the, the storage aspects. Um, and if you want to use hydrogen for vehicles, um, the storage is perhaps the hardest challenge of those three. Um, so for vehicle applications, the Department of Energy has targets, for example, how many grams of hydrogen per liter of your, your storage system, or a weight percent. And I hope these are correct. I looked them up over the weekend for 2015 targets. And they're the system targets, so that includes the tank. Um, and the idea would be, um, the vehicles that you see on the road right now for demonstration purposes all just use compressed gas. What you'd like to do is fill that tank with some sort of porous, spongy material that would suck up the hydrogen um, and then release it when you want it. And that you could actually store more hydrogen in the tank with that material in there than you could in the empty tank. So there are a number of different classes of materials that people are looking at. And, um, so we just recently got funding from the DOE um, to develop new carbon-based porous materials um, with increased heats of absorption for hydrogen storage. And again, these are the, the PIs involved. And there are a couple classes of materials that we're looking at, and I'll tell you a little bit more about those. And we have an integrated team here with synthesis, characterization, um, and modeling. In that same call for proposals, um, Northwestern did quite well. They awarded 10 awards, and Northwestern got two of them. I'll, the other team is led by Chris Wolverton, who's at a conference this week, but he, he gave me a slide. And um, Chris is joined by Harold Kung here at Northwestern, people at UCLA, and also people at Ford Motor Company. And they're looking at a complementary class of materials. Um, so there's perhaps things that we can learn from one another and the fact that we're all here together. Um, we're thinking will be very advantageous to us. Um, so I want to introduce some new materials, show you how modeling can help us design materials, and briefly mention some of the challenges for the modeling. So the materials we're looking at are, are made in a, a building block approach. So you have metal corners and some sort of organic linker molecule that has appropriate functional groups at the end so that when you link the, or when you mix these things together, they want to link up and form some sort of porous material. Um, so the, you end up with a porous crystalline material um, with very well, well controlled properties. And one of the nice features of this general approach is that you can change the organic linker and still get the same basic structure. So you can get a whole class of materials with that given structure. So you can think about changing the pore size, um, but perhaps more interestingly, you can think about putting different chemical functionality in there through the organic linker. And so you've introduced it in a very well-controlled way. Um, as I said, they're crystalline. They're incredibly open, very light, which is one of the reasons people became interested in them for hydrogen storage. 
And we think they have applications beyond storage in things like adsorption separations, sensing, and catalysis. So there's a whole zoo of these new materials being formed, different topologies. And again, for, for uh, a given material, you can think about making different changes by changing the organic piece. Um, so we really have what you can think of as molecular tinker toys. So if there's one image from the talk that I hope you'll remember, it's, it's this one. And um, a little piece of trivia, it turns out that tinker toys were invented right here in Evanston. Um, and so now um, my colleagues are, are making very similar things, but of course on a much, much sp smaller scale. Okay, so I'm not actually making them though. I, we're doing modeling. And um, I think modeling is gonna play a big role in this field um, because the synthetic roots are fairly predictable. So if you dream up structures, there's a reasonably good chance that um, somebody can go into the lab and actually make that material. However, I'm learning from talking to my colleagues more and more that that's not a trivial thing. So you need to make the material, then you need to characterize it, and then you need to test it. So if we can use modeling to screen materials before they're synthesized, this is tremendously useful. Um, in addition, we hope that the modeling will provide insights and understanding that might be difficult to obtain purely from experimental methods. Um, so the type of modeling that we're doing um, just very briefly, it's, this is based on a classical picture. We have some sort of force field that describes the energetics. We feed this into stimulations based on statistical mechanics, and we hope to get things like the amount absorbed, the enthalpy of absorption, and some idea of what the molecules are doing inside the pores. Um, so we have in-house codes to do this, so we're developing codes and, and methods, um, and for other um, purposes, we use commercial tools and the usual kinds of hardware. So this is the kind of thing we want to do. We want to be able to predict the amount absorbed, so this will be milligrams of hydrogen per gram of material as a function of pressure. And here's the comparison of simulation and experiment. And the agreement is not perfect, but I think it's reasonably good. And I want to emphasize that this is, it's really a prediction, so we're not um, adjusting the, the parameters to match this. This data is all at fairly low pressure and very low temperature. Um, a few years later, another group published some data at much higher pressures. And um, again, with that same model, we were able to predict this, I would say, essentially spot on. And this graph really illustrates one of the big problems now. So if you look at 77 Kelvin, the weight percent is up around 10 weight percent. This sounds fantastic. That's near the target. Um, but it's at 77 Kelvin. You don't want to run your car at that temperature. Um, the problem is at room temperature, these materials just don't absorb very much hydrogen. Um, so we've been looking into how can we improve that situation, looking at how the hydrogen uptake correlates with different properties of the material. And I think I have too many slides, so I'm going to skip a little bit of this. But with modeling, you know, you can very quickly screen a large variety of materials and look for trends and try to get some understanding. So we can predict these isotherms for a bunch of materials. Um, and the bottom line here is you've got plenty of surface area. If you could take that surface area and coat it with a monolayer, that would, you, would, you would meet the targets. The problem is it's not going to stick in there at room temperature. So what you really need to do is increase the, the adsorption enthalpy. Um, the low enthalpies are good in some sense because it's easy to get the hydrogen back out, but you're not going to be able to store enough at room temperature. So the objective of this new uh, DOE project we have is really to increase this, this binding energy, the adsorption enthalpy. And a number of strategies have been suggested in the literature. Um, the one we're looking at is to introduce charges, in particular um, light cations like lithium. So Joe Hupp's group has already published an experimental demonstration, one, that they can make these metal organic frameworks with lithium cations inside, and two, that it does improve the hydrogen storage. And um, modeling also predicts that you should be able to get sizable improvements through this strategy. Um, the modeling turns out to be tough, though. Um, various types of modeling indicate that the ideal adsorption enthalpy for this application is around 15 to 20 kilojoules per mole. And that, that ends up being in kind of an awkward regime. If the Binding energy is really strong. Methods like density functional theory work great. 
If it's really weak, like the materials I showed you so far, you can use these classical force field models, and that works well. But this middle region is tough. Um, you can go to higher level ab initio methods, but you're limited to a very small number of atoms. So this is one of the, the challenges for modeling these types of systems. Um, so in summary, um, I hope I've shown you that uh, metal organic frameworks are an interesting class of new materials for hydrogen storage and potentially other applications. Um, we think molecular modeling can aid in the design of these materials, and there are some significant challenges for the modeling as well as the, the synthesis and characterization. Um, I'd like to acknowledge again the, um, my collaborators here and the students and postdocs who worked on this, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Right, yes. Mm -hmm. We should definitely talk. I mean, we've done some preliminary things already with, you know, a bare lithium ion or a very small cluster, but yeah, we should definitely talk. We haven't done a lot of in situ work yet. Um, it's one of the things I've already talked to DJ about and it came up at lunch also, yes. Because we have some evidence from some of the experiments that when you absorb certain gases, the structures do change. And that is something we'd like to be able to characterize and argon may be a, a great resource for that. <laughs> 